My name is Autumn McDonald and I am the director of New America, California. New America is a think and action tank based in Washington, DC. And we also focus on issues of economic uh, equity, uh, innovation, civic voice, et cetera. And in doing that, part of the way we do that is through forums that we host from time to time. And we are excited to have you join us for this one virtually. I want to tell you a little bit about who's uh, joining us here today. We have John Irons, who is a New America Fellow, New America Future of Work Fellow. We have uh, Jean Holm, who is the Chief Data Officer for the City of Los Angeles. We have Anmal Chada, who is the Director of the Equitable Futures Lab at the Institute for the Future. And we also have uh, William Kehoe, who is the Chief Information Officer for Los Angeles County. My co-moderator today is Niles Friedman, who is a executive advisor with Star Insights. Thank you all for joining us. And again, this is a conversation that is going to delve into what it looks like to reimagine the workforce, to reimagine work, and to think about what mobility and digital innovation looks like in that context, in this moment, if you will. If you want to take this conversation online, we uh, we ask that you go ahead and do so. You can do that by using the hashtag reimagining work and tagging at New America. Feel free to also tag any of the speakers to include them in whatever conversation you wanna start online. And with that, I am happy to get us started. I will begin with John. Hello, John. Hello. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit about your background, and then finally, just tell us a little bit about your current role. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So first, um, thank you very much for putting this panel together. Um, you know, if I weren't on the panel, I would be tuning into the panel. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. Um, as you said, I'm the Future of Work Fellow at New America. Um, I also have affiliations with research centers at the New School, MIT, and Stanford as well. Um, my work over the last several years has very much looked at the intersection between technology, work, and social impact. Um, before joining New America this winter, I directed the inclusive economy programs at the Ford Foundation, also at the Rockefeller Foundation before that. So I try to approach these issues both from an academic perspective, but also from an eye towards change and impact as well. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks so much, John. I'd love to ask you, Jean, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and your current role. Sure. So my name is Jean Holm, and I'm the Chief Data Officer at the City of Los Angeles. I'm new in that role. I was previously the deputy CIO for the city for a few years. Before that, I spent 32 years at NASA as the chief knowledge architect, six years with the Obama administration as the evangelist for open data and helping to run data.gov, and then, which I hope you all have gotten data from. And then a few years working through Central Africa uh, on training and capacity building with the World Bank around open data. Um, I'm just really excited to be here and helping to share the story of what we're doing in Los Angeles and learning from all of you and um, and excited about bringing forward the ideas about equity and digital inclusion. Fantastic. Thanks for being here with us. Anmal, hello. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Anmal Chada. I, am, uh, I work with the Equitable Futures Lab, which is part of the Institute for the Future in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, we deal generally with looking at the economic, broader economic and social transformations and how they can, they may be uh, creating opportunities to address problems of economic and social inequality. Uh, I've previously been at the Federal Reserve Bank where I worked primarily on um, improving job quality in low wage industries and for low wage workers and around issue, issues around racial wealth inequality. Um, and right now, the big project that we're working on uh, in the Equitable Futures Lab is to coordinate and manage the Future Work Commission in California that the governor created last fall. Fantastic. I've had the opportunity to attend most of those Future Work sessions, commission sessions. Uh, thank you so much for that. Those, those have been fantastic. Uh, Bill, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your current role, and your background? I'm sorry, Bill, I think you're still muted. There we go. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Bill Kehoe. I am the Chief Information Officer for Los Angeles County. I also am very, very happy to be here today. Uh, this topic is very relevant for LA County and for all 
all of government and in all the country right now as we're working through this this COVID-19 pandemic and we're working through the changes in, in work life uh, that that presents. Before LA County, I was, a, um, I was the CIO for King County, Washington for seven plus years. And before that, the CIO for the Washington State Department of Licensing. I would say that in my CIO roles, I've been fortunate that um, I've been put in as a change agent to modernize organizations, reimagine how services are delivered by implementing new and emerging technology and to um, help transform business services. So it's a little bit about me. Looking forward to the discussion. Hello everyone, uh, this is Niles Friedman. Uh, really excited to be here to co-moderate with Autumn. Uh, Autumn, I just wanna say this has been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with you on this webinar um, and really sort of elevate this topic and engage some real amazing thought leaders uh, across California. Um, you know, I think today there's a lot of different areas we wanna hit on with some of the core questions. I think before we go into some of that, we really wanted to frame what this meant. So I think terms like mobility, digital innovation, innovation for that matter, are used quite widely. Um, I think sometimes they're used to varying degrees of depth. So we really wanted to frame as we go into this discussion about challenges and progress and your vision for the future as we think about the workforce, but specifically, what does mobility mean to you? What does digital innovation mean to you? And we'd love to have you guys each spend about maybe one to two minutes giving us your insight and thoughts. And Jean, if you'd like to kick us off, that would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. So people often think about mobility as the movement of people and goods. And in cities, that makes a lot of sense. But I actually think that it also includes the movement of data and ideas. So how do we make that happen? A lot of us who are able and have the privilege of being able to work from home, goods and services aren't necessarily moving, and yet we're still able to get a lot of things done. So when we think about that, we think about sort of traditional things like autonomous vehicles and, uh, and urban air mobility as we think about autonomy in the air. Uh, we use drones for the city of Los Angeles for our fire department, and at our port of Los Angeles, we do a lot of automation. But it's also about mobile access to city services for us. So trying to make sure that that mobility of data and ideas occurs. And when we think about digital innovation, I think it's really the ability to harness data and technology together to improve the ability for people to thrive in a way that is ethical and respects data privacy. So I think those last two pieces are really part of the more current conversation around data and technology, which is really this idea that we have bias in some of the systems and some of the things we do. So there's a lot of things that I think we'll talk about today that are that blending for digital innovation around data and technology and human, um, the ability for humans to thrive. Great. Thank you, Jane. And I love the fact that you're integrating innovation into data and analytics and it's sort of this holistic package. I think that's a really important dimension um, as we sort of engage on this topic. Uh, John, would love to hear your thoughts on, again, mobility and digital innovation through your lens. Um, of course, when, when I think about mobility, I think both about mobility of data, like, like Jeannie said, um, but also I think a lot about mobility in terms of the economic dimension of it, economic mobility. Um, and that's both people's ability to get ahead, um, seize opportunities, both during their lifetime, throughout their life, but also think about intergenerational mobility and how people move from generation to generation, um, both in an absolute sense about are people able to do better than their parents and their grandparents, but also in a relative sense, are people able to move up from one income quintile to another income quintile? Um, so that's another dimension that I, that I tend to think about. Um, on the automation, sorry, on the, the digital innovation side, um, I, I think there's been a lot of discussion and everybody's been in a million discussions about the role of technology and innovation on uh, work um, through automation, AI, robotics. That seems to be what a lot of people tend to talk about. But for me, I tend to also think about um, how innovation is really changing the way we connect to work. So the job itself might not have changed very much. You're still driving a car around, driving a taxi, but you connect to it through an Uber. Um, you're still doing um, housework, but it's connecting to it through a task rabbit or something similar. So I think that's an important distinction to make about technology is both changing work 
It's also changing how we connect to work. Um, I think that second piece for me can, might be the, the, the bigger influencer in, in, in the changing workforce and work. Good. Thank you, John. And I mean, it really speaks to the diversity of this panel that we've got, uh, you know, the lens on the economic impact as we think about these topics, but through the lens of research and policy as well. So thank you for that vantage point. Uh, Bill, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, mobility and digital innovation, what that means to you. Great. Um, it's going to be tough in two minutes, but I'll give it a shot here. Um, uh, I love what, uh, what Gene and, and John um, how they defined it. I think um, we have a mobility strategic goal here in LA County. So we have a very pragmatic, I think, uh, understanding of what we're trying to achieve there. It has both an internal employee perspective in terms of um, giving the, uh, our employees the ability to work anywhere at any time and our residents. So it has an external component as well that uh, we want to provide our residents the ability to receive services and transact with LA County anywhere, anytime without having to drive into the city and, and go to an office. So there, there's both of those, uh, those components. I think um, it's important from an internal employee perspective that you know, we're providing the right tools, whether that's devices, whether that's collaboration platforms, so that when our employees are remote and we're seeing over uh, 30,000 LA County employees right now uh, during the COVID pandemic that are working remotely, that they have the right tools, they have the right devices, and they have the right infrastructure to be successful and be productive as they're working um, externally. And then for our residents, making sure that uh, where we can, that we provide the ability to transact with the county and receive information online without having to come to an office and without having to mail in a form and have that form processed and so on and so forth. So those are both, um, I think, important from a, um, from a mobility perspective for us in LA County. We're trying to make strides in those directions and we've been forced to make quick strides uh, during the pandemic. As far as um, digital transformation, um, to me, that is transforming our services that we provide the public by infusing new technology, innovation, but really solving business problems and creating internal efficiencies as well uh, with technology. So we're focused on that. I think, uh, as Gene said, data plays a big role in that. And uh, the, in the future, how we use our data is gonna be extremely important. So. Uh, we're focused on creating that linkages with, uh, with our data, and I, I'll talk more about that in uh, upcoming questions. Thank you, Bill. And I, I think this is a really important dimension of this discussion as we think about reimagining the workforce. You can, in your case with LA County, go directly to the 30,000 employees um, and giving them the infrastructure and the tools to be mobile to deliver services. But at the end of the day, um, that's going to impact residents of LA County. And so how does that impact them? And is that being brought into the discussion? So I love that distinction to really think about like how do you mobilize the employees, but then how does that lead to maybe better services or the delivery of services to the residents uh, in this case of LA County? Um, very good. Um, Anmol, uh, you have a really unique perspective given your background in research and technology transformation and then some of the work you've been doing at the state level. I uh, would love to hear about your vantage point and take on mobility and digital innovation. Sure. I think, you know, I think with my background, especially in, in social science and in social policy, like, like John, I, I tend to think of mobility in terms of social mobility and economic mobility. Um, and he laid out a really great description and, and definition of what that looks like, whether it's between generations so that pe how people, uh, their life looks in relation to their parents, uh, or even within their own life course where they started from, depending on what neighborhood maybe they were born into or what schools they started in or, 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 and where they end up later in life and, and the potential for being able to move up in the social, uh, social strata within our society. I think it's so close, that, that concept of social mobility is so closely linked to inequality and that's uh, it, mobility and inequality are often used interchangeably. I think it's important to think about uh, the ways that those can be a bit distinct as well. Um, 
I think of sort of metaphorically, if we think of a, a ladder, a social ladder and mobility is this sort of the, how easy it is for people to move between the rungs of the ladder um, in society. But inequality really shows us how far apart those rungs are, right? And so you can imagine, theoretically at least, a situation where maybe people can move between the, those rungs with relative ease or easier than in some other societies. So you have more mobility, but the rungs are still quite far apart. Or you could have a situation where the rungs maybe are closer together, so there's less overall inequality, but people are really stuck in their station in life, and so we have much less social mobility. I think they do tend to move in the same direction, so where we see more inequality, we also see less mobility between strata, but it's important to really sort of define what the problem is that we're, that, that we're interested in, and that will influence, of course, the solutions that we think about in sort of addressing those problems. Thank you very much for that. I mean, I think this just speaks to the depth of ex expertise um, that hits on so many dimensions, whether that's research, whether that's policy, whether that's government operations and strategy, uh, technology. And so I, I think this is really a great foundation from which we can jump off for some of the core questions. Thank you all for engaging in that. Great. And just as Mal said, it's important for us to be able to see what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, data innovation or digital innovation, as well as what we're talking about when we talk about mobility. Uh, recognizing that there are some differences and interweavings between those terms, but what we're ultimately doing is using those as we think of what it is to reimagine the workforce or how we work. Um, and using those as levers makes us have to think about what, it, what is it that we're reimagining or what, are, uh, what is the way that things have changed. Um, I would love for each of you to talk a little bit about your role, your lens, how you've come to this and how it has changed since COVID. So if, if you would be willing, Anmal, I'll start with you to tell us a little bit about how you were seeing the key challenges, uh, the key kind of goals of your work in November, November 21st, versus <laughs> how you're seeing that now on May 21st. Right, that's great, that's a great question. So I think before, um, in, in the last year before COVID, there was, or the last several years, I think there was a lot of discussion around what, what became this the field of the the future of work and that was a big concern um and i know john has worked done a ton of work on that as well um and that's of course what led the the state to create this commission on the future of work and i think we could go far a little bit farther back than even just last fall i think um i, I think it's important to look back over the last several decades if you look back to the 1990s and there's huge policy debates around social welfare social policy and welfare and at the time the debate was really whether welfare had failed Right, whether welfare, welfare had failed to do whatever it was intended to do. And the uh, sort of the votes in, in Congress were, were based on this idea that welfare had in fact failed and that the solution to whatever those failures were should be work, right? That work should come to take the place of welfare and it should provide it, that by relying on work, people would be able to access a livelihood and be able to support themselves and their families, et cetera. And then I think that in the years since, and especially in the years, uh, in the previous years leading up to COVID, what many workers saw, what many families saw, what many working families saw was, you know, while some of us were, were talking a lot about the future of work, a lot of people were also, would have been asking about the failure of work, right? That from the 90s, work was meant to be a solution to whatever the shortcomings were of social policy. But in many ways, for many, many people, work had failed to do that. Work had failed to provide a decent livelihood. It failed to provide access to mobility, to, to ways to move up. And a lot of that has to do with the, the proliferation of, of low-wage jobs, the disappearance of, of middle-wage jobs. So whatever skills or training people could get through whatever programs existed, there weren't necessarily jobs for them to move into that would, that would improve their circumstances. So I think thinking about the way that work and jobs had failed many people even before COVID, and then I think, I think in, in California especially, we're quite familiar, we, there's a sense of um, a few different kinds of crises. There's an environmental crisis, there's obviously a housing crisis in California, and I think what we begin to see is there's also a job crisis, and more specifically a job quality crisis. So even in the context of an extraordinary economy, 10 straight, ye 10 straight years of month-to-month -month job growth, um, what we saw was that the majority of people working in the state were in jobs that they did not define as good jobs. A fully a third of all people working in California were earning less than $15 an hour before COVID. Um, and so 
it, even though we, California had sort of, was really the most successful economy, if you look at macroeconomic measures that we had seen, so many in the state had failed to benefit from, the, from, from those economic achievements. And I think that was, that was where we were at before COVID and the, the Future Work Commission was engaging with that very deeply. Um, and then since COVID, I think in many ways, it's revealed so much of that in, in much starker relief. Um, Annie Lowry from The Atlantic had a great piece last week, I think, about essential workers and how essential work has, has really been systematically devalued or undervalued and primarily through policy choices over, over recent decades. And we're seeing that now in very, very sharp relief um, in addition to really high unemployment. But, uh, you know, we, it was, if, if we had folks running around uh, not considered direct employees, doing deliveries or driving people around, but then when we had a massive unemployment crisis hit very suddenly, there was no policy mechanism to even deliver what were really pretty basic social supports to them. So um, I could talk a little bit more about how we've been thinking about framing some of those issues, but that's just sort of, sort of initially how I think where we were a year ago lines up with where things are at today. Can, can I jump in on that real quick? Because I think my point is <clears throat> directly related to that, and then you can skip me later if you need to. No, 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 um, please. But, but I think one of the particular ways that the jobs have failed people um, is a lot of the jobs are increasingly what we would call precarious. So part-time, temporary, outsourced, gig-like, fissured, fissured meaning you work for a contractor, works for a subcontractor, works for you know, a company um, up the food chain. And those jobs are just much more insecure. Um, and even for jobs that are full-time, 40-hour week, those are beginning to feel more and more like insecure jobs too. And what this recession has done um, this, this crisis has just shown that for what it is, that it's exposed that weakness, right? The same way in the 2009 recession, that exposed financial crises, financial weakness. This is exposing the weakness in the labor market and the jobs that we had. Um, so I think for me, that's the biggest thing that has been not so much changed, but exposed by the, by the current crisis. Thanks for jumping in, John, because that point is obviously very much connected to what was just said. And I appreciate both of you. This is ultimately about what does it take to thrive, right? So this question, at least in the way that you guys are coming at this question, and that that hasn't changed as, as a challenge. It hasn't changed that you know, not enough people have, you know, middle wage jobs. There are far more low uh, low paying jobs. In some recent human-centered research that we've done at New America, California, we spoke to uh, some 35 different workers, and one of the uh, key findings was that there are some jobs, but not enough good jobs. Um, and so it speaks to that piece of economic precarity. I would love to uh, move to Bill and ask you to share a little bit about your November 21st versus, um, what day are we on? May 21st, there we go, thank you. Okay, well, yeah, uh, different world for sure. Um, you know, I'll just address this from a, a county services perspective. Um, you know, we've had a, a very clear strategic plan that we had in place uh, in November and, and before that uh, related to mobility. So we were really moving in that direction around mobility, but also trying to increase the engagement with our, uh, our, con our constituents um, through a digital uh, civic engagement uh, strategic plan as well. And, and then really um, looking at um, empowering our workforce, uh, training our workforce for the modern world, transforming our procurement process, and really um, innovating around the services we were, we were delivering. So there were some good things happening, um, but the, the urgency around those, especially around um, mobility, uh, we went from about 13%, if that, of our workforce that was working remotely. Um, we still had a lot of folks, um, a majority of our employees commuting into the city, into county facilities. And, um, and then during the day, uh, driving out to meetings and, um, you know, and, and so the commuting and the um, inefficiency of that was something we were trying to address. And then quickly we had to pivot to, you know, 32,000 employees now that were telecommuting. So that, that has accelerated a lot of the uh, strategies we had, a, had in place. It's validated those strategies as well. 
um, I get a lot of, wow, that, that, that goal that you keep um, talking about ad nauseum is actually really important. Uh, we, sh we should be providing the option of our employees to, to work remotely. Um, we're looking at things like hoteling now, reducing our facilities footprint, um, more opportunities for the public to receive um, information and transact with the county over the web. So um, it's changed dramatically. And now when we, we're looking at, okay, now what's, what does the return to work look like? I don't think it's ever gonna look like it did uh, in November. Um, I think we're gonna have, uh, and I, I don't wanna use the word new normal because it's overused, but our work life is gonna be much different uh, moving forward. Thanks so much for that. I think you've hit on the urgency that is brought up by, by this, I won't call it a situation, but this new era, if you will. Uh, and I noted in the chat that someone was uh, just asking the question about, you said that it was 13%, is that correct? That was telecommuting and now all 32,000 employees are telecommuting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and, uh, quite a difference. Yeah, a huge difference, a huge difference. And the other thing that's really interesting about this is just this idea of what it looks like to figure out what kind of those next steps are in terms of what you might be doing differently. And, and you're figuring that out in a different way, right? Like normally you have a new idea of how you might transition to something else that your organization or business does. There's a whole bunch of ideation. We ideate some more, then we ideate again. And then slowly we move to the next thing. And that, that hasn't been allowed now. On my, um, my husband is a physician and he was talking about how they had been thinking and talking about telehealth and doing visits, you know, and then suddenly let's got to get it done. Uh, so I think it's a really interesting you point, uh, point that you bring up as, as we think about the urgency and the need to just kind of get it done quickly. Jean, I would love to ask you that same question. Uh, November, 21st to May 21st. What were some of the key challenges? What were the things you were thinking about, et cetera? So I think on November 21st, I was in Barcelona, Spain at the Smart Cities World Congress. Um, I can't even imagine getting together with 80 to 100,000 of my closest friends now in that kind of a space. Um, and I think it'll be a while till we get back to what we consider normal or how we define the new normal, right? Like this is really how we reimagine the spaces and places and ways we want to work together. But, you know, kind of at the end of last year, we were really focused on a few key issues in Los Angeles. Bill mentioned a few of them. Homelessness, first and foremost. Issues around equity, which Amal and John have talked a lot about. Uh, climate change, the mayor, Lee, Mayor Garcetti leads the C40. And so we were very focused around what we thought was going to, and what will still be a defining aspect of this, this decade, which is the way in which we mitigate climate change. Those are all pieces that we were focused on. We are a city that has adopted the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. And so we were looking really at global growth, growth and collaboration. We deployed last year our Shake Alert LA app, which is an early earthquake warning app and um, built on some of the success of other mobile apps uh, and getting people access. And um, we had been focusing a lot on partnerships. So uh, we, started the Data Science Federation, which is a collaboration with 18 local universities. And we just um, realized that, not, that, that the way in which things have changed is not just how and what we choose to focus on. We still have to focus on those things, but we focus on them, I think you've all mentioned, with an urgency that we didn't ever expect to be able to address. So we have about 50,000 employees at the city of Los Angeles. Um, not all of those jobs can be virtualized, but within 11 days, we were able to telework 24,000, so about half of our workers. But we still have to pick up trash, we have to care for the animals at the zoo and the shelters, and so there's still some pieces that have to be done physically. Um, but that was one of the very swift changes that happened so that we could be able to keep city services running and, and, and help. And really the focus, post-COVID has been, or with the emergence of COVID, is public safety, public safety, public safety, right? Everybody has become a data scientist. Everybody needs to have data literacy and digital literacy in order to be able to understand why the city officials are, and the mayor and others are asking people to stay safer at home. Um, it's really just, I mean, people could 
choose to do other things. People could choose to go out, but they are being convinced in a way that they haven't traditionally paid attention to with data and some of the digital tools we have to be able to help them make these decisions and understand why we're asking so much of people and asking people to sacrifice so much. And we're also focused even more on digital inclusion aspects. So as we have moved to more services online and as we've closed down public counters and libraries, we've realized that there's, well, we've, we always knew that there was a big digital divide and we've worked on a variety of digital inclusion efforts, including computer giveaways and digital literacy training and support through our public libraries. You can check out a computer or a Wi-Fi hotspot, but a lot of that came to a bit of a crashing halt. And we've been just really working again in partnership with our telecommunications companies to provide free services through Get Connected Los Angeles for basic needs. And, and the one thing that was a big concern before that is not a concern now, and this is probably true for wherever you live, is traffic. So we were number one in a bad way with traffic in Los Angeles, and, and now it's, it's, a, it's very bizarre to drive down this, the streets of the city. Um, and, and I think that the, the shift has been one about not just on public health, but a shift to this ability to urgently and very quickly make fundamental changes and watch the, the aspects of uh, behavior change from the people who live and work in the city and really understanding what, what motivates people and how to communicate with them. We do a lot of sentiment analysis on social media to understand what messages are effective with folks and what people are asking about so that we can modify the policies to be as supportive of what people are struggling with as possible. But I think we really get to the end where kind of Amal started us on this part of the conversation, which is really around equity and social mobility. And, and all of this is just breaking at the edges, the fragility of some of our social systems and the ability for people to have that mobility. So when we talk about digital innovation, I just, I really want us to think about not how it helps a, many people, but how it helps all people and helps get data in, in digital inclusion and uh, reskilling and tech skills and the future of work as being sort of helping the, the poorest among us to get access to those skills and those capabilities. That's such an important point, right? Like we have to figure out what it looks like to use these tools, things like digital innovation, to be able to allow us to answer this larger question of what it takes to thrive. Uh, and that's why we kind of listed it as a kind of key tool through mobility, through digital uh, innovation. Uh, and I think you all have just brought up the point, which is that these problems were here and there's the greater urgency, they've been exacerbated. And it's upon us to figure out how to not let uh, a crisis be squandered, if you will, this opportunity that exists to potentially rebuild, reimagine, to not go back to the way it was, but to instead to move forward in a really powerful, equitable, and inclusive way. Thanks, Autumn, and thanks to the panelists. I mean, I think this really is a great segue into our next question. And just to piggyback on what you were saying, Autumn, I, mean, I think the environment pre-COVID, as you can hear, there were a lot of investments. There were a lot of, there was a ton of advocacy happening. Uh, within government and on the policy level. And I think it really speaks to the leaders in, in, on this panel, but I think a broader swath of leaders that have really been pushing for uh, really a strong mobility strategy. How do we redefine the workforce? And I think being very intentional, I totally agree with you on the aspect of innovation. Um, and how does that become an enabler to something much larger? So I think in the spirit of this, we really wanted to also um, get into this mode of progress and movement. You guys have tapped into that and touched on this a little bit in the context of the challenge discussion, but obviously there has been a tremendous amount of work that's been done in a relatively short period of time. And we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And practically, you know, what does that mean for LA County? What does that mean for the city of LA? What does that mean for research and policy um, at the state level in other jurisdictions? I think that's gonna be a really important dimension of this. So I'd love to hear from each of you guys for you know, maybe about three to four minutes about what you've seen as it relates to progress, what you've seen as it relates to movement, um, and how do we harness that as you start to think about the way forward. Uh, Bill, I'd love for you to kick us off here, given some of your perspective and work within LA County. 
Great, yeah, I could talk about a lot of things here. Um, I'm gonna focus on the data aspect um, and what we're doing there because it, it's really important as we're looking at uh, analyzing COVID testing results and analyzing the impacts of that and making adjustments in our strategies and feeding that to our public health uh, frontline workers and our, our first responders. Um, so we have a, um, a really uh, important asset in LA County. We call it our information hub. And over the last four years, we have been linking client data within our health community and that vertical within our family and social services uh, departments and also our justice departments. And the, the intent of that was to be able to provide research and analytics to our, with our, to our data science uh, family around the types of services that clients are receiving from LA County. Um, that 360 degree view of those services uh, for an individual, which is very powerful. And then instead of looking at just what, type, what types of services a, an individual is receiving, also then looking at the uh, eff effectiveness of those services. So how effective is a service when an individual uh, is released from jail and receives services? What happens after that? Do they go back into jail? Are they, do they now become pr productive citizens? Um, and then also looking at uh, this data from a, a homeless perspective, which is a huge crisis in, in LA County. And uh, what can we do um, better in that situation in terms of the services we provide and the outcomes that we receive? And during this COVID crisis, I would say that um, our team here has been tapped and the information hub has been tapped to really do some deep analytics around COVID, around the testing, around those most susceptible uh, and, and really uh, take some more proactive steps than reactive steps. So the power of data, the power of linking data, um, the the power of looking at the, the effectiveness of the services you're providing and making adjustments to those based on the data. That to me is, is the innovation and the type of um, a digital transformation that, that can occur if we're using our data more effectively, we're linking it, and then we're putting uh, that information in the hands of the decision makers. So. Um, that is a focus that we're going to continue to do uh, in terms of linking additional data and um, really using that uh, more effectively in the future. Great. Thank you, Bill. And I think what you're speaking of also really connects again with this whole idea of reimagining the workforce. If you're able to use analytics and data and the information hub within the county to better support what residents need, what users need, what customers need of the services, that really reshapes how you define the workforce, how they're structured, who they are, what is the background, but how does, how, as you said from the beginning, the tools and the resources and that mobility infrastructure can really be used to better leverage at the end of, at the, end of the day, service delivery for residents of the county. So I love that whole premise and Gene, you hit on this from the beginning with respect to sort of that integration between data and digital innovation and mobility. Um, Anmal, would love to hear your perspective. Uh, you know, again, you've been doing a lot of work, it sounds like, at the state level most recently. Um, I don't know if you've seen and seen some movement and progress given your work there and um, even outside of that, given the work with your lab. Yeah, I think the most straightforward thing at the state level is just is the, um, the way that the state, the, the capacity of state government to to keep up with the extraordinary demands that's, that have been placed on it in this current situation, just unprecedented numbers of people either filing for benefits or, or just even trying to access the systems. And I think we've seen that, uh, that perfectly throughout the, throughout the state government. Um, I do think it's, it's interesting, and I learned so much from these conversations from, from the other panelists as well. I think it's, just, it's really interesting to me to, uh, to hear about what, how digital innovation is talked about in the private sector and how it had been, especially before COVID. And then to hear a couple of the panelists who are firmly based in the public sector talking about what digital innovation looks like there and what I think what some of the driving either values or principles may be 
that are quite different, right? That are about serving a broader public in an equitable, effective, efficient way. And that's very encouraging, I think, to folks. It should be encouraging to all citizens and especially encouraging the people who work in policy. Um, whereas I think before the, the sort of private, the, the, the tech community may have been focused on apps or services that were about delivering, you know, using digital innovation to, uh, you know, to more effectively or quickly pick up laundry and get that clean and, de and deliver to people and meeting sort of what, whether those needs were, you know, how, how critical those needs are may have been questioned. And I think there's, a, before COVID, what I hope is that uh, now in this new, new context, there's a, a brighter light being shined on the public sector and its capacity for digital innovation and, um, and the way that they're implementing a lot of these new ideas. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot just, just listening to Bill and Jean and others, and I would love to just continue to hear that. Great, thank you. And I mean, I really connect with your sentiment there. I, I've spent probably the last uh, 15 years of my career really looking how to build innovation capacity within government, both at mm -hmm. a global level in Africa, uh, at the federal level, state level in California, and with the county in Los Angeles. And I absolutely agree with you that there's not only a desire, but there's a real um, interest to figure out how to mobilize and engage and create those partnerships. I think you know what you're seeing is this also focus, it's always been there, but there's a real deliberate focus also on user needs, customer needs, resident needs. Um, how do we start with that from the beginning? How do we think about outcomes as it relates to those types of investments? And how does that really link in? So I think that's a really important point as we start to think about this on a broader scale. Um, Jean, would love to hear your thoughts uh, coming from the city of LA. Sure. So I'll start at the smaller level, which is um, uh, we really have seen a huge investment in virtualization of services, but with an eye on equity. So I uh, suddenly feel like I could foresee the future because a year ago we virtualized the 311 call center at the city. Um, so I ran the call center and uh, I just seen the struggle that people had. There were a lot of them were in the sandwich generation where they were caring for aging parents and young kids and they're commuting from a long way away through LA traffic. And, and so, you know, we just had a conversation with the people in the call center and said, why don't we see if we can't let some of you work from home? That took a long time, uh, but we got all the right people involved and we had, we changed some of the policies for the call center. We worked with labor unions. We worked with all the folks there. And so for a year before COVID, I, we had, virtually all, but a few who didn't want to, um, be able to work virtually. And that meant that when we had to immediately virtualize the city, we had a well thought out set of policies that people had lived with and had evolved over the last year. And so we had something to build from. And I think, I think in many cases, I noticed in the chat, some people are talking about the need to be able to pivot, that innovation's about being nimble and being able to pivot quickly. And I think that that's spot on, right? This idea of digital innovation is sometimes just being able to do things really quickly and change to accommodate differences in the environment. Um, we have mobile worker program at the city, which means that people have cell phones um, and uh, rather than desk phones uh, in many departments. And that made it very simple for people to access it. Um, we also, I think, have changed our investments in uh, mobility. We used to architect, I mean, LA is very much a car culture. Um, Bill can kind of validate this, right? We architect our cities around vehicles. Roads, I think, make up something like 15% of all land in Los Angeles. And, uh, and parking structures make up an ungodly amount of, of land. And, and what we've been doing even before COVID, but particularly now as we have this opportunity in the midst of this tragedy is to think about architecting our cities around people, around spaces that support people in healthy ways. We're working with the Slow Streets program like a few other cities are, which is trying to make sure that we are able to um, allow people more outside space, even if it's along a, a street and being able to create sort of pocket parks that give people that ability to connect with green spaces. So our investment in mobility is, is, uh, is looking a little different than we might traditionally think, which is better architecture of roads, but our Department of Transportation and the general manager there, Salita Reynolds, has really been thinking about how we, do with, how we deal with mobility around this uh, supporting architecture for people, which I think is really interesting. 
One of the other things too that uh, is a, kind of an opportunity in the midst of, of this pandemic is what's happening with climate change. So uh, we just recently were awarded a NASA grant for a couple million dollars around a project called Predicting What We Breathe. And I serve as the principal investigator on that. And this is looking at combining satellite data and ground data from our Internet of Things smart, smart city data sets, uh, which could be on a street light or a trash truck. And, um, and we work with Bill's team and the Air Quality Management District here in Southern California to really look at how we can better predict the kinds of changes we make as a city and the policy changes and what effect that has on air quality. What we didn't realize when we started this project, and that uses machine learning and AI, what we didn't realize when we started this project is that we would have this crazy opportunity where human activity essentially ceases for a large portion of the population. And the earth is given a moment to breathe. And now we can look and see if we were to do these kinds of changes, not that we intend to do these kinds of changes, but, but in small ways, would these changes have a positive effect on air quality? And, and there's just so many people that are affected by issues around air quality and lung disease. And so I think, I think when we, when we, with that, that, that aspect came up in the chat with the, with the group here about pivoting and nimbleness, it's, Digital innovation is not just about doing the things that are necessary to be mobile and, and innovative and getting out in front of other cities. It's about how we look at these um, moments of opportunity when there's so much tragedy and, and concern and trying to find ways that we can become stronger at the end of this and be able to have an environment and a world and a city that's designed around supporting the people in it in the ways that they want to live. Great, thank you, Jean, on that. I mean, I think you're hitting on many different sort of topics, um, but I think what I'm hearing from you is this lens of possibility and can we pause and step back and see what we can do differently. Um, I think this really connects into some of the work that Bill was talking about on a practical level, right, within the systems, right, within the mechanics of how government works. Can we step back and see, hey, we've been able to do this as respect to a remote workforce in a matter of months. Can we step back and figure out, well, what else can we do in a matter of months versus years? So there's a real theme here that you guys are really starting to, I think, hit on, which is really powerful as you start to think about internal operations within government, how to deliver services to the public, but then these more broader civic issues around the environment. I mean, you're really talking at a real macro level of what can we do how can we think differently? And I think this ties nicely into policy work, um, John, that you're doing. And would love to hear your perspective on uh, both the progress and the movement that you've seen, um, you know, in the last couple of months. Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of the things that have already been said too. And, and I'll pick one of them, which I think is um, intriguing, at least to me at, at this current moment, um, which is essentially the rapid modeling that's being done out there, um, particularly in the case of COVID, but this is happening other places too, where people are taking data from different places and putting them together and doing really interesting modeling around it. Um, you see that with you know, the COVID projections that are connecting with cell data to determine the degree of connectivity to people, right? So the mashup of different kinds of data that's being adapted and updated in a really rapid fashion. Um, I think that that mindset could be applied to other areas too. Um, in the area that I know best, that I can work in jobs, I would love there to be, you know, that level of detailed prediction about where jobs are being lost, what are, what's being projected, who are the people who are going to be losing those jobs, how fast do they get them back. And that kind of rapid modeling, I think, could be really of benefit as like an early warning system. Um, I almost want the, uh, the, the Kinza uh, map for, for the economy, right? So Kinza is the, um, for people who don't know, they make... Um, uh, thermometers and they connect it to an app and so we have all this data about elevated levels of people's temperature at a very granular level all across the country and so what they do is they model where they would expect a certain degree of uh, elevated temperatures to be where they're seeing deviations from history and using that as a way to predict potential hot spots on a daily or hourly basis right so it's that kind of data and the modeling around it which i think could be hugely could be valuable in many different areas. So it's a little bit of a mindset change that I think would benefit many different areas. 
Um, but I do have one kind of open question though too, and I would love if, if Gene or Bill had perspective on this also. Um, I, I'm worried, or not worried, but I'm wondering, I'm curious about, you know, the jobs have become remote. Is it simply about doing the same job someplace else? Or is a job itself going to fundamentally change? Um, my gut says that it might be the latter. In the history of innovations, when you do see a new technology, you then see the, the job that interacts with that technology also changing in, in an interesting way. That's very hard to predict. Um, so I think we might be seeing this, that same kind of um, dynamic play out. We're first going to see the same job being done remotely, and then you're going to see the jobs change over time. So that's something that's in the back of my head. Very good, John. I mean, again, this is, I think, the power of a group like this. You guys come from such diverse backgrounds, but you're hitting on some real key themes that I think really start to elevate this discussion. Um, we want to be mindful of time, and I know we want to get into some of the questions that participants have been asking and make sure we get those in front of our panelists. Um, you know, why don't we do this, Autumn, maybe just kind of engage a bit on the visionary question. Uh, we wanted to sort of tee up with each of you you guys have touched on it, so I think it's a great way to sort of segue into what does the vision of the future look like? What does the workforce of the future look like? Um, given the work that you all have seen over the last, you know, the, the scenario that Autumn picked from November 2019 to May 2020, um, but what does the next six to 12 months look like? Uh, what do you envision? I know you guys are amazing thought leaders and probably have a ton of ideas of where this could go. So we'd love to hear for a few minutes on, from each of you on not only what is that vision, but sort of how, how you see it playing out and on a practical level, what can be done, um, you know, in, ideally in a matter of months versus years. Um, John, why don't we have you kick us off, uh, given you sort of teed up, I think, that great uh, discussion around analytics. Yeah, so I think this is the hardest question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, predicting the future is always a risky, risky business, especially now. Um, you know, my perspective is that um, in the near term, if you think six to 12 months as being relatively near term, you know, I think it's going to be the virus that dictates uh, what, the, what the work looks like. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about what shape the economy will be. Will it be like a U shape where we will have a long downturn? Will it be a V shape where we'll bounce back relatively quickly? Um, my perspective is that uh, our response to the virus, to the health crisis, will dictate what the work situation looks like, um, not, not vice versa. Um, and that we really need to you know, do first what the health experts say now, because that's gonna be the number one thing we can do to, to keep, you know, keep as many jobs possible and keep the economy running. So um, you know, my thinking, like I think like a lot of other people, you know, has dramatically shifted in horizon. You know, what's happened 12, you know, six months, 12 months from now is what's on my mind. The five year horizon, which is what I used to think about, um, is now seems to be very dependent upon the, the six month horizon, um, which, you know, I think there's um, potentially negative consequences to that because we do need to be thinking about the long term at the same time we're thinking about the, the short term. Um, and so if our attention is focused on the here and now, um, that it's getting harder to see what that long term vision looks like. Um, but I agree with what people have said, we're not going back to the way things were. Um, I, I agree with, with Gene that like the 80,000 person convening in Barcelona, hard to see that happening again. There's a lot of things that I see in my future that, you know, I, I, I would not have guessed I would not be doing, but I think that's where we are. Great. Thank you, John. Um, Bill, would love to hear about your sort of ideas on a future vision as it relates to mobility and, and how, how digital innovation really supports that and enables that. So, you know, the, the future, the way that um, I see it and the way that we're trying to paint that picture in LA County is uh, from an employee perspective, um, you know, our jobs are gonna change dramatically I think um, we're going to have to, at least on the technology side, we're going to have to be much more nimble and fast in, in what we do and very focused on the investments we make. Um, you know, the economy taking a hit uh, is, is Im impacted uh, the county uh, tremendously. So going forward, um, you know, the investments that we do have are going to be uh, very focused I think we're going to take on projects that are much more innovative 
that go towards high impact in terms of uh, transforming the services that we have, um, introducing technology like uh, robotic process automation and AI, and um, technologies that uh, can provide efficiencies, but also high value and, and transform some of our internal services and external services. I think, as John indicated, I think our jobs are going to be much different uh, in the future. I think that's an accurate statement. I think we're going to be much more focused on assessing the services we do provide, introducing data and data analytics into, as I said earlier, analyzing the effectiveness of those services, uh, making some fast adjustments, and then on the technology side, inserting technology where appropriate, but not for technology's sake. Um, we're having a lot more discussions on the digital divide and what can we do about that. That's, a, that's actually become front and center uh, during this crisis and we're looking for partners to help us uh, with that situation so that we don't have communities that can't get access to the internet. Uh, we don't have uh, communities disadvantaged by that. So I think uh, a lot more focus on innovation, a lot more focus on investing in high impact, low cost solutions, um, and then uh, really making government respond much faster than we have in the past. Great, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, I think that's a very inspired vision and I love the, I love a lot of the tentacles and sort of aspects of what you guys are doing and what you're thinking about. Um, sounds like a real shift in culture and uh, a shift in way, uh, the way the, the county potentially operates and serves the public. Um, Anmol, it would be great to get your perspective on sort of a future vision. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, any ideas uh, that you have around this topic? Yeah, I think I, I think that John is, was spot on in terms of in the next, in the short term or near term, thinking about how the the course of the virus is going to really dictate what the what jobs look like and what the economic conditions look like. I think in terms of policy and policy responses, I can we can think about three I think distinct phases as it rolls out. I think the first is is the is relief, and then which is what the, the phase or stage that we're in right now. Um, and then moving into a second phase of stimulus, and then a third phase, which is probably a longer term phase of recovery. So from re relief to stimulus to recovery. And I think um, there's so, it's so urgent right now around relief uh, that I, I hope that we can also keep an eye towards what that recovery will look like and to try to ensure from the policy perspective that it's a high road recovery, um, that it's a recovery that is really about the creation of whatever uh, of new jobs that are good jobs, well-paying jobs that come with the sort of either benefits or guarantees or protections that that will provide people with a path upward, um, you know, in the workplace or, or really throughout their lives um, and be able to support their families and things like that. I think when we think about the last uh, crisis that we faced a little bit more than ten years ago, coming out of the financial crisis, we had a recovery from that that didn't that that we know. Um, led to wider wealth inequality as, as a lot of the economic gains that came out of that were concentrated towards uh, folks at the top and that wages didn't really increase in any really meaningful way since in over those last 10 years. So although the macroeconomic situation may have looked better um, and the employment numbers look better, we didn't really see the benefits of that really being shared throughout the economy. Um, I think that it's when we think about usually in policy conversations around jobs and work, it seems that uh, for a long time, people would often, it would almost universally go to something around skills and training as sort of the obvious solution to any sort of jobs or work problem. I think that this current situation is, I imagine will really challenge that. And, and to show that, you know, if we're in a situation right now where we have at least 15% unemployment by official counts, it will likely be much higher than that. Um, that these skills and training programs and sort of certification programs aren't going to be enough to overcome that really huge, huge economic obstacle. Um, I think the state of Michigan last week or two weeks ago put, put out an initial recovery plan that, that really emphasized certifications as a path forward for people who are losing their jobs. And I think something like that looks really in, 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 insufficient. I think it's important to think about what tech, tech change, tech innovation, digital innovation can do and what it can't do. And I think there's a lot of opportunities here, but we also 
so some of the underlying structural problems in the economy and the labor market weren't necessarily created by the lack of technological innovation or digital innovation. So um, digital innovation can be an important part of beginning to move towards a different future, but it's really addressing some of these structural, uh, underlying structural problems is gonna be a major part of that. And I think lastly, I'll just say, I think at a much higher, a much broader level or higher level, I think for a long time, the, the conversations had been, especially around the future work, had been sort of anticipating how work would be changing because of technology, especially because around automation, um, what sort of, um, what, what will the jobs of the future look like and what kind of skills or, or things would people need to be able to do the jobs of the future and essentially what will we need to be doing for work in the future. And I think when we approach things now and we see it from a much, uh, an, an equity lens and, and some of the, the values or principles that we care about, rather than focusing so much on what it is that we anticipate we will have to be doing for work, or for our jobs, it's really important, I think, from the policy side, what is it that we want jobs and work to be doing for us, right? What is the role or the social role that we want work to play for, whether it's people in California or, or beyond, if, if people are working full-time job, what, 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 what's the social compact around that? We've had, we had that for decades. We had at least an idea around that. We know if we expect work to change, does the social compact need to be updated? And, and what we look for jobs and, and work to perform for citizens, does that need to be updated and changed? And then how do we chart a vision to reaching that? Or how do we chart a path to reach that vision that we have for jobs in the future? Great. I love the sort of practical steps that you're outlining. And I think trying to create this connection and integration. Um, and you're talking about data to drive prioritization. You're talking about different phases of recovery. Um, a big theme on some of the chat uh, questions from participants has actually been about how do you guys as a, as a group think about automation? Because this was a topic before COVID, but how does this impact uh, the workforce, workforce on a very different level, especially with uh, issues around the economy, um, job growth, et cetera. So I, I think this is something maybe we can unpack in the Q&A, but I wanna make sure, Gene, you have some time. I know you've already sort of teed this up in the last question, which was great, but kind of you know, your vision, what are you thinking about in the next you know, six to 12 months, what is the city thinking about? And would love to get your thoughts on that. Sure, and, and I, I love all the ideas that everybody's put forward. I, I resonate with components of each of those. I think there's a piece maybe that hasn't been addressed, which is the nature of what is a business is changing. So we do have a social compact. I think that's been a bit shattered over the last couple of decades with businesses and employees and lots of different uh, dynamics there. But, but this idea of what kind of businesses will survive the next couple of years is, is a little bit uncertain, right? Um, so, so I used to travel all the time for work and I do not envision doing that a lot in the future. Even, even after a vaccine and even after, as John points out, the virus drives a lot of the behavior, people will have fundamentally adjusted to certain things. And whether or not that adjustment persists is yet to be determined. So I think we need to look at some of the big industries like tourism and travel and the oil industry. Uh, there's just a lot of things that have radical changes that may or may not survive in ways that we recognize in the future. So, so putting that into the context lets us think differently. Maybe I'm going to disagree with one of our panelists here with them all a little bit. So I'm a professor at UCLA. I've been teaching for over 20 years and I teach in our, our poorer communities in Pico Union in South LA. And what I think is that the ability for reskilling with certain caveats and taking this time when people are at home may actually be an opportunity that we can all try to make happen. So if we think about small aspects of digital and data literacy, if we look at small certificate, micro certificate, I'll go way down. <laughs> My, sorry, I won't, I, try, I won't try to tread on that Michigan territory. Micro certificates, if we look at just the ability, if you're a waitress today, but then you have a little bit of financial literacy and a little bit of digital literacy training so that you're able to kind of accommodate more online orders and support the, the restaurants in a different way, you may be more hireable as we move forward. And, and, who knows exactly how that will all happen. So I, I think there's this opportunity for education and training to play a role if we address three things. One is what industries are gonna survive in each community and be able to rehire large numbers of folks. Number two is how do we deal with people across the digital divide? 
how do we give people connectivity, accessibility, and data liter digital literacy? And then number three is how do we get people to want to do this? And I think that that last piece is the piece that we are still trying to understand. All of the data, all of the information has affected the pe way people behave and change their behavior. And people have made great personal sacrifices, huge sacrifices, to try to help their community be safer during this outbreak. And I think as we move forward, people are going to need to figure out what their new balance is, what their new norm is for how they are able to participate in the economy, have, a gain, get, have gainful employment, and be safe. And, and we haven't figured all of that out yet. I posted an opportunity in the chat for folks. We are launching a COVID computational challenge. It doesn't get much geekier than that. Um, that opens up on Monday and actually opens it up to a global community to help us understand some of these issues and challenges. Um, we're, we're using LA and I'm, I'm partnering with Bill's team as a geography to understand what are the risks for me to go out in public and how do I understand those risks in a way that's really simple and I don't have to have a ton of literacy and I don't have to have a ton of technology. And so this challenge will bring ideas together and data and tech and innovation and storytelling to really try to move us forward into that space of how we find our new balance and our new norm. So, so I believe that at the end of this, we will be a stronger nation together. We will be a stronger global group of innovators and entrepreneurs and data geeks who are able to find a way to make the best out of what is really a difficult situation and one which we can come out the other side stronger together. You have led me perfectly into our final question before we go to questions. At New America California, we do these forums to the end of something being different, some tools, some resources, some information that's accurate, some way for people to act. Um, and so you've already started us on that with here is a, a good way for you to engage. I put it in the chat. I'd love to ask each of you briefly, because I do really want to get to the questions, uh, to tell us just maybe one or two things that you think those listening should know. If it's a resource, it's a tool, we're doing it this way, check out this link. Um, is there anything that comes to mind besides the one you just shared, Jean, that you would like to um, lift up? Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of tools and things out there, but I, I would like to point out that for everybody, wherever you live, the strongest tool you have is the community of people who care about making where you live a safe place. The businesses, the residents, the people passing through, everybody there wants to come out of this stronger on the other side and reach out to them, build a coalition, work together, open up new partnerships. And that is the best tool that we're having in Los Angeles for getting through this. Fantastic. Uh, let's see, Bill, do you have a tool resource thought of how people can uh, make a difference in this, in this moment? Yeah, I will, I'll focus, um, I think, on our, our partnerships with the civic tech community and um, the partners that we, we have. I think that whole relationship is, is going to change. Um, I think we need to partner more on the, um, the innovation side and less on you know very large multi-year type projects so i think our uh, our relationship with our um our partners is going to change we just launched and are finalizing a homeless tech innovation challenge that i think is going to be a model that we build on and improve on where we're asking the tech community to come in um in within four challenge areas and really tell us how they could innovate around those without prescriptive requirements. So I think there's an opportunity to redefine uh, how we partner with our, our tech community and our tech partners. And I think we need to take advantage of that uh, moving forward. And I know there's some, some questions around that in the Q&A. Fantastic. Well, John, do either of you or both of you have a tool or resource? Yeah, I might, I might flag one. Um, and this is um, in, in the spirit of we have to really think about redesigning the economies broadly, right? So it's not just about work, it's not just about tech, it's about everything fitting together and, and at the, the local and regional level as, as well, not just nationally. 
Um, and there I'd steer people to an organization called NGIN, the New Growth and Innovation Network, N-G-I-N. Um, it's a network of local economic development um, professionals who are really thinking about equity in a serious way, participation in a serious way, and how to think about designing um, broader systems at the local and regional level. Um, so for many people who are on this, this video, that might be relevant to you and your work. So I'm sure you can find it on a quick Google. Um, and full disclosure, I'm on their board. So, uh, so I think they're, they're a good group. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add uh, just two really quick ones. I think um, last week, the uh, Omidyar Network put out a really thoughtful, I think, framework for thinking about how we can think about the new economy and work, especially in, in, after, in, the, in this new context of COVID and, and, and address some longstanding issues, but then also thinking about what, what COVID has, has, um, has revealed and, and sharpened. Um, so I would check that out. And then the other group that I think is really at the forefront and had been before COVID and continues to be is, is the National Domestic Workers Alliance has done a lot of incredible work um, before they had developed a platform for essentially portable benefits for uh, domestic workers um, over the last couple of years and where employers who hire domestic workers could pay into uh, a fund that could be used for benefits for domestic workers and has now been repurposed as a way to get emergency assistance directly to domestic workers. Um, that's a, a, an occupation that typically falls outside a lot of uh, state or, or government regulation around work and is extremely difficult to support through social policy. So I think they're, they're incredibly innovative and, and are one of the most impressive actors out there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I want to segue into some questions. I'll jump in with the first one and then I think Niles will ask the second. Uh, and I'll also just, uh, Anmal, thank you so much for noting Aijen Pu. She is just phenomenal. So all things she does, just huge fan. Uh, so the first question I want to ask is kind of related to partnership, if you will. The question is, how can the IT industry help governments? What do you need from the private sector? And um, just to orient, Anybody who feels like they have a response to this can answer. You don't all have to answer if you don't feel like it's relevant for you. I'll, I'll address that. So the IT industry has stepped up in Los Angeles in, in a lot of amazing ways. Um, we have an Angelina Fund, which provides uh, support to families who are struggling financially. And we've had many tech companies uh, donate cash to that. And we've also seen them come up. I, I also dropped in the chat a link to our Get Connected Los Angeles site or the telecommunications companies, which I mentioned before, have been really generous in providing at least temporary low cost or no cost services, particularly to healthcare professionals, educators and students. Um, so I think those things are really meaningful and helpful. The tech issues, I think both John and Bill have mentioned the digital divide is, is a matter of life and death. And the tech companies that can help families and individuals and kids kind of overcome that right now are really doing, you know, amazing work. And I'll just add to that, that we need, um, and I'll just take off from my last, um, my last statement, we need a new relationship. We need uh, the tech community to understand uh, what our needs are and to introduce and partner with us on solving those very, very uh, uh, crisis type problems that we have, a digital divide, homelessness is another one but just in terms of the services we provide so we can continue to assess and improve our services quickly. A lot around data. We need a lot of work to help us around uh, utilizing our data, analyzing our data. Um, but I think there, this is an opportunity for us to redefine that relationship and have the tech community innovate around our problems versus us telling them what we need in a, a typical government RFP. So I'm excited about that. All right, uh, if there's no other thoughts, I will jump into a second question. Um, the question stems really, we were talking about this a little bit earlier around automation. So um, the automation uh, movement has impacted the workforce well before COVID. Um, the participant that sent this question in said, this has obviously accelerated that movement and has, has put an emphasis on the knowledge 
of work. Uh, their question is pretty pointed, you know, how do we navigate this disruption? Um, and for folks that are not able to potentially maybe get the skills as it relates to coding or data scientists, or data science, excuse me, um, what, how, how do folks basically navigate? What are some suggestions or recommendations for folks that are interested to engage in the workforce and the changes ahead? Um, ideas that folks might have from the panel. Well, maybe I, I can jump in a little bit there. Um, and I think we need to distinguish a couple of things, right? First is like the short run. Um, we're gonna have 25% unemployment for you know weeks, if not months. Um, and so there's like that immediate crisis that we need to, to address that has very little to do with automation, um, if, if anything at all, right? So there's getting ourselves on solid footing is by far the first priority we have, I think, I think now. Um, in the longer run, I, you know, I think automation has um, played some minor role in a couple industries and displacing jobs. Um, but I think that the, there's so much other forces that are in play um, that have potentially larger impacts, um, potentially trade as an example, um, loss of unionization, another example, right? So a lot of the problems we're seeing are not necessarily driven by automation. Having said that, I think whatever trend there is, is likely to, to the questioner's point, likely to accelerate. And here, I think we need to have essentially early warning systems. So we need to know, know which industries are likely to be both high touch or even what occupations within industries are high touch and highly automatable, right? So if we understand those combinations, then we'll have a sense of where we need to look first in order to provide some assistance either to reskill people before the jobs are, are lost or to support people um, if and when their, their jobs are lost too. Um, and I think that's important to say that it's important to support um, people broadly. So no matter why you lose a job, a lost job is a lost job. And from a, you know, a personal perspective, if your job is lost due to trade or due to automation or due to something else for you, that's still a really bad outcome. So we need to be supporting people and developing the systems to support people, no matter why, no matter how and why they, they lost their, their job. And to do that in a permanent way. Um, I think that a lot of what uh, the federal government has done on unemployment insurance has been really good. It just pains me to think that we'd have to do that again in an active way, right? So it shouldn't take an act of Congress to provide short-term support. That should be built into the system. Um, and I don't think that that's what we have have right now. And so that goes to the longer term change I think we need to see. Great, thank you, John. Does anyone else have any input or thoughts on that question? I just um, we, we need automation, I'll just say that. <laughs> and uh, our processes um, are somewhat manual. And I believe the automation, like I mentioned, robotic process automation will mm -hmm. really help um, employees that were, were maybe stuck on a job where it was very manual um, learn new skills. So it's not going to replace the job, but it will provide opportunities for employees to learn new skills, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Jean, did you have some thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say that it was a little ironic, John, that it doesn't, you said it doesn't take an act, shouldn't take an act of Congress to give people help they need, but it does. Um, I, I think that, that, people like Bill and I have to think differently about what this means for the future of cities too. Like what is our, our responsibility? I mean, traditionally the city in LA doesn't deal a lot with social issues and public health. And yet right now we're, you know, all in it together. And so we're, our teams are very integrated and working together. And I think that that collaborative, maybe a little more boundaryless um, aspect of how people support their communities and how they think of their social responsibilities is changing. And that you see that with everybody, everybody on the street who's wearing a mask is taking on a social responsibility and doing something that is awkward and inconvenient and sometimes difficult because they care. And I think that that is something that we can build on coming out of this is, is how to, to take that caring spirit and, um, and figure out how that helps people who are in economic hardship. How do we lift up each other to be able to, you know, make these businesses transform in ways that will re-engage and re-employ? 
Well, thank you guys for the responses to that question. Thank you all. I, I would love to ask this kind of final question, which is a, a mix between a call to action, if you will, something that you would like those who are listening to do. And then also, maybe what would you like them to use their platforms for? For instance, is there some sort of message, some high level kind of thinking that you would like them to be the ones to be trusted messengers of? Uh, so it could be either or, it could be both. If you are um, able to share them uh, rather succinctly, we would love to hear your call to action. And I'm going to start with Anmol. Oh, wow, that's a tough question. I think um, I think the challenge is that there's so many there's so many efforts to respond to the the urgent crisis today that are happening at so many different levels. Um, I think that. Uh, especially state and local governments are are going to are, are are already facing huge challenges, and I think that will continue for a while. So I think, um, it, and somewhat inspired by some of the panelists today, I think thinking about how people can plug in best to support the efforts, the really innovative efforts that are happening at the local levels and at, at the state level, at least in California, I know the governor's created. Um, a larger task force to guide the recovery from COVID. Um, and it's, it's a large group of 80, 80 folks that are um, really tackling a lot of really difficult questions around what, what this looks like going ahead. And, and I think in a lot of ways, we don't have a lot of answers. But I would say the, the more we can focus on ensuring, again, like I said a few minutes ago, that, that the recovery we do end up with is a high road recovery. And, I, and also the sense that how we come out of this isn't necessarily, it's not inevitable, right? That these are the result of policy choices um, or that through policy, we have the ability to shape a lot of this terrain and the way that these forces play out, that they're not, that whether it's automation or whether it's other economic forces, that they're not just uh, inevitable things that will just play out how they do. They play out within a certain context, within a legal and policy context. And, and through state government and federal government, they can lay down a lot of the guardrails for how that plays out. And we know in the, from the past, major economic transitions and industrial transformations have uh, affected different groups, different people differently. Um, you know, some have gained, others have faced, especially if we think about deindustrialization, even in the last about 30 years ago or so, that a lot of the, the costs were borne by low skilled workers, by black workers or, or workers in cities, especially in the Midwest and, and, and the industrial belt. Um, and so the gains are not evenly spread apart and neither are the costs. So I think we're facing another transition, major economic transition coming ahead. So I think whether it's at the local level or the state level where people can really act to ensure that, this, that the transformations and the recovery looks like a, a vision of what they want it to be, and except that it's not inevitable that we can play a role in shaping that. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, Bill, I'll go to you. Please share your thoughts, your closing thoughts. Well, I will just say, and I, I don't want to take too much time, um, but I will just say that uh, what I believe has, uh, this crisis has shown is that we have incredible public servants that are dedicated to serving uh, their communities. Um, and we have folks that are working day in and day out to whether it's uh, putting our homeless population in, uh, in hotels, project with a project room key, whether it's our first responders, whether it's our uh, public health and our health workers uh, on the front lines. Uh, I think what you're seeing is an example of uh, a response by government that's just incredibly inspiring. I think it's brought us closer to um, the, the people that we serve and um, it's shown how important it is to have a strong government uh, and, and how important the services that we, we provide are to, uh, to the people we serve. So um, that's a message I really want us all to take away is that we are doing everything we can through this crisis to provide good information, provide the services we need. And, and in a lot of cases, um, our frontline workers are putting their, themselves at risk to, to serve those uh, that need the help. So very inspiring to see. Thank you, very much appreciate that. And then uh, John, if you will share your uh, parting words and your call to action. 
Yeah, I mean, I think at, at the risk of um, issuing a call to action that everybody's already doing, um, I think that w what I've seen and what I've been encouraged by um, are, is the degree of partnerships um, between private sector, government, social sector, and every combination um, across those, those three. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe a challenge is if you haven't done that, uh, do that. Um, if you work for a tech company, reach out to a local nonprofit, reach out to the government. Um, if you're in the government, reach out to, uh, you know, a, a tech company or um, some other private sector organization. Um, and I think if everyone just challenges themselves to, to do that, um, I think we'll come out of this with, with more innovations and, and better solutions. Um, like I said, I think it's already being done. And part of what I'm encouraged by um, going forward is the number of people who are setting aside prior self-interest and coming together in different kinds of ways. So I hope that can continue. Thank you so very much. And Jane, if you'll just close us up. Sure, so I posted another opportunity in the chat. Um, so I would just encourage people to think about joining our COVID computational challenge or becoming a data angel. Uh, here in the City of Angels, uh, where uh, people work on data science problems and we're particularly focused around COVID right now, obviously. Um, so those are just two like very tactical things. And, and every government has some kind of a volunteer core that you can make a difference. So if you're not in government, but you'd like to be part of helping right now, there, there is an opportunity in your hometown, wherever you're at. The other thing is sort of as a call to action is really to hold forward hope. Right, this can be a really daunting time. Things can be really overwhelming. People are losing friends and loved ones. It can um, seem like we're never gonna get past this, right? But in this time, we have this opportunity to step into this space that's been made to share, to help others be safe, to uh, make your community stronger. And each of us has different skills that they're bringing and different challenges and, and different things that are going on in your own life and you know working families are home trying to homeschool their kids while they're you know struggling to to get employment but just think about what you can do with your own skills to help your community be safer and stronger we will get through this together a vaccine is eventually going to get there um, it's going to take a while and we all have to be patient and realize that there's hope at the end of it and that that's the reimagined future is one where we may not be doing the same jobs we were doing in November 21st, but we're going to be doing meaningful and important and gainful employment in the future. Well, thank you all. I feel like this has been just fantastic in terms of your insights, your thinking, the way you've inspired us and you've also educated us, I think. Uh, thank you to all of those who are in attendance. Your conversation in the chat has been fantastic. And uh, just as a quick piece of follow-up, there will be a recording of this session available on the same website where you registered uh, within 24 hours. And then also uh, there will be a follow-up email that kind of pulls together some of the key takeaways and key thoughts that have been shared today. Thank you all so much for being in attendance. Thank you to our panelists for their time and their insights. Be safe, everyone.